Now, those of you who just want to tip the hat to Jesus and not bow the knee to Jesus, let me tell you this about Jesus. Jesus is God. And if Jesus is not God, Jesus is not good. How do I know? Jesus Christ himself said so. Jesus said there's none good but one, and that's God. Put it down big, plain, and straight. Don't just flatter Jesus. Don't just tip the hat to Jesus and say, Jesus is a nice fellow. You don't tip the hat, you bow the knee. For over 50 years, pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers preached to audiences and touched lives all over the world with his unique brand of solid biblical teaching. His teaching has been described as profound truth, stated so simply a five-year-old can understand it, and yet it still touches the heart of a 50-year-old. And you'll hear that in today's message. And if you're encouraged by today's message, remember you can stream this message again and download Pastor Rogers' outlines, notes, a transcript, and other resources to go along with this message, all at lwf.org. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. Find God's Word, Mark chapter 10, and in a few moments we're going to begin reading in verse 17. There is a problem, a real problem, and that is that people attend church, they listen to sermons, they join churches, but they are never radically, dramatically, eternally changed. They have religion, but they've never met God. Uh, many churches today are filled with baptized pagans. Baptized pagans. They have been vaccinated. Are you listening? Vaccinated with a mild form of Christianity, and they've never caught the real disease. And so the church may be full, but the, pe the people are often empty. They come, they go through the motions, they try to live outwardly a good life, but they have never really, truly found a new life. They've never been converted. Now, with that in mind, I want you to look at the passage of Scripture here in uh, Mark chapter 10, and I begin in verse 17. And when he was going forth into the way, now the he refers to Jesus Christ himself, there came one running and kneeled to him. And by the way, Matthew tells us that this was a rich young ruler. There came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he, that is the rich young ruler, was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible but not with God, for with God, for with God, all things are possible. Now, there are four things that I want to lay on your heart. We're talking about three strikes and you're out, and that'll make sense when I get to the end of the message. But there are four things I want to lay on your heart that come directly out of this passage of Scripture. Number one, proud men at their best are sinners at their worst. Now, put that down in your heart. Proud men at their best 
are sinners at their worst. Now, you may not see it on the surface, but this man was quite proud of his achievements and outwardly had much to be proud of. As a matter of fact, outwardly he had very much that we would admire. First of all, I like his eagerness. The, the Bible says he came running. He's full of the strength and, and the vigor of youth. And I, I like enthusiasm. Now, I know there's some folks who come to church on Sunday morning. I can see a sign hanging around your neck right now. It says, please do not disturb. <laughs> you are not enthusiastic about the things of God. I love people like this man who had this vibrant enthusiasm. And not only was he enthusiastic, he was humble. I mean, he comes and he kneels uh, before Jesus. Now, Jesus was a peasant prophet from Galilee. This man was a rich, young ruler. He had position and he had possession and he had power and he had prestige and he had it at a young age. And yet there he is uh, out there in the broad, open way uh, uh, kneeling before the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I like that. There are a lot of people and some perhaps in this building today who are going to go to hell because of their abominable pride. They don't want anybody to know that they have any needs in their life. And so when the invitation is given, they'll look around to see if any of those old sinners are going to go forward and give their heart to Jesus Christ. Another thing I like about this man is this, uh, that he was, he was discerning. He knew there was something about Jesus that was different. And so he said to Jesus, good master. Good master, what must I do uh, to inherit eternal life? He knew worth and he knew goodness when he saw it. Now, we have a lot of people who cannot even discern goodness, even in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're cynics who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Something else I like about this man was that he had his mind on spiritual things. He said, uh, he didn't say, what must I do to make a killing in the stock market? What must I do to have pleasure and ease? He asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What are you interested in? I mean, really, what are you interested in? Most of us are not interested in going to heaven or trying to miss hell. We, we're just interested in tomorrow and the humdrum round of life. Here was a young man who asked a very vital question. I want to know about eternal life. And I'll tell you something else that's very admirable about him. Outwardly, he was morally clean. Uh, Jesus said, you know the commandments? He said, Lord, I've kept them from my youth up. And outwardly, he did not steal. He did not commit adultery. He did not lie. He wasn't taking God's name in vain. He, was, he uh, kept the Sabbath. All of these things. He honored his father and his mother. I, he would have made a wonderful neighbor. Uh, this was the kind of a man you could trust when you go away on vacation to look over your things. He was a man that you would not be afraid for your children to be around. He's, he's morally clean. He'd have made a great associate in business. If you were looking for a business partner, you'd say, boy, this, this is the young man. He's got it all. He, he's, he, he knows how to manage things, and uh, he has morals. He's trustworthy. I'll tell you something else about him. We're just talking about his good points. Uh, when you think about it, there was so much to admire. He was successful. I mean, he had success, folks, and he had it at an early age. And again, Matthew 19, verse 20, uh, Matthew said that he was a, a rich, young ruler. Do you know, if he had joined the average church in America, they would have welcomed him in, and you know what they would have done? They would have made him church treasurer. They would have made him church treasurer. They said, look at this guy. He belongs in who's who. He belongs on the front of Forbes magazine, and uh, he's just a wonderful young man. But Jesus did not praise him or pet him or flatter him. Jesus seems to, uh, to treat him kind of roughly. Look in verse 18 and see what the Lord says uh, to this man in verse 18. He says, Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. Now, Jesus is teaching him in this one sentence two things. Number one, Jesus is teaching this young man that he himself is not good. Jesus is teaching this young man that he himself, the young man, is not good. This young man thought he was a quite a good boy. And Jesus said, look, there's none good but God. 
The second thing Jesus was teaching this young man is that Jesus himself is God. Now, those of you who just want to tap, tip the hat to Jesus and not bow the knee to Jesus, let me tell you this about Jesus. Jesus is God. And if Jesus is not God, Jesus is not good. How do I know? Jesus Christ himself said so. Jesus said there's none good but one, and that's God. Put it down big, plain, and straight. Don't just flatter Jesus. Don't just tip the hat to Jesus and say Jesus is a nice fellow. You don't tip the hat, you bow the knee, because Jesus said there's none good but one, that is God. And what Jesus was saying in this one sentence, I am God and you're a sinner. I am God and you're a sinner. There is none good but one, and that is God. And by the way, you might want to put in your margin Romans 3. Verses 10 through 12, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. I want everybody to say silently, but in your heart, not even me. Not even me. I am a sinner. Nobody. Nobody, nobody has ever been saved until he has seen that he is a poor lost sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God. Now, this man is talking about eternal life, and Jesus shocks him and says, there's none good but one. That is God. You know, there are people who join churches today like they're doing God a wild favor. They come down the aisle and, and uh, join churches. They, they are religious, but uh, they have never seen the holiness of God and their own sinfulness and the wrath of God against sin. Here's another verse. Exodus 34, verse 7. It speaks of the character of God, and it says he's the God visiting iniquity, of visiting the iniquity of the fathers of, of, among the children, upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Well, let me back up and get that whole verse. Keeping mercy for thousands, thank God for that. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, thank God for that. But now listen to this. And will by no means clear the guilty. God is a God of mercy. God forgives. But the Bible also says that he will by no means clear the guilty. You know what that means? It means that God is love and God is justice. Now we hear much today about the love of God. God is love, God is love, God is love. And that is true. He is a God of mercy. But that's not all of the truth. And if you, if you take part of the truth and try to make that part of the truth all of the truth, then that part of the truth becomes an untruth. God is a God of mercy. God does forgive iniquity. But the Bible says that God will by no means clear the guilty. Don't think that somehow when you stand before God, God is going to look at your sin and God's just going to say, well, that's all right. That's all right. Listen, friend, if God were to clear the guilty, God would become guilty. I hope that sinks in. If God were to clear the guilty, God would become guilty. God would topple from his throne of holiness. If God were to countenance sin, if God were to overlook sin, if God were to bypass sin, then God becomes a sinner. Do you know what they say in the court of law? When a guilty man is acquitted, the judge is condemned. When a guilty man is acquitted, the judge is condemned. God himself would become a sinner if God let sin go by. And so, uh, what is Jesus teaching this young man? Jesus is teaching this young man that proud, proud men at their best are really sinners at their worst. You know, I, I, the people writing books today with titles like this, uh, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Come up close, I want to tell you something. There are no good people. There are no good people. You say, who do you think you are? Just a preacher preaching what Jesus said, who said there's none good but one, and that's God. That's what the Lord said. You see, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl has been truly converted until he sees himself a sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God. There's none good but one, and that is God. Now, why did I say that good men at their best are sinners at their worst? Why didn't you say that bad men are sinners at their worst. Because the worst sin, the worst sin, the sin of all sins, the worst form of badness is human goodness, 
when human goodness becomes a substitute for the new birth. The worst form of badness is human goodness. Jesus said that prostitutes and crooked tax collectors were going to heaven before the Pharisees because they had, they had their self-righteousness as a substitute for God's mercy. And so I want to say to any person in this building today, no matter how nicely you may live, none of you live as well as this rich young ruler. And yet Jesus looked him straight in the face and said in verse 18, there is none good but one, and that is God. The worst form of badness is human goodness when human goodness becomes a substitute for the new birth. Have you got that? That's the first thing I want you to see. I want you to see this, that proud men at their best are sinners at their worst. Now, here's the second thing I want you to see. God's perfect law condemns man's sinful pride. Look, if you will, now in verse 19 of this same chapter again. Uh, Mark chapter 10 and uh, verse 19. Thou knowest the commandments. Jesus now is beginning to talk about commandment keeping to this man to help him to see that he's a sinner. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. Now, if God is a holy God, it follows, as night follows day, that that holy God will have holy laws. Now, listen to me very carefully, because if you're not listening carefully, you're going to miss the whole thing. Jesus is not, underscore that, is not teaching salvation by commandment keeping. He is teaching just the opposite. But you have to pay attention to see what Jesus is teaching. You see, the Bible teaches that you're not saved by keeping the commandments. But yet this young man said, how do I have eternal life? And Jesus begins to refer him to the commandments. Now, what Jesus is teaching this young man is he is not keeping the commandments like he may think that he's keeping the commandments. Now, commandment keeping has never saved anybody. Put in your margin, Galatians 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. The law, the Ten Commandments, cannot save anybody. While the Ten Commandments do not save you, they are an essential element in evangelism and salvation. What is the purpose of the law? Why does God give us the law? To let us know that we're sinners. Romans 3 verse 20, listen to it. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. God gave us the law to let us know that we're sinners. And Jesus is using the law right here to teach this young man that he's a sinner. And so Jesus begins to talk to him about the commandments. Now, you may think that you're pretty good until you come up hard against God's law. Now, when Joyce and I were on our honeymoon, uh, we were driving down US 1 near Daytona Beach. And uh, I had just come through a small little town there and uh, was driving along about 45 miles an hour, and a policeman pulled me over. He said, young man, you're breaking the speed limit. I said, sir, I'm not breaking the speed limit. I'm only doing about 45 miles an hour. He said, the limit here is 35 miles an hour. I said, well, why don't you put up a sign that says the speed limit is 35 miles an hour? He said, we put one up. I said, I didn't see it. Well, he said, it's back there about a mile. I suggested you go turn around and go back and take a look at it, would you? And so I did, and he let me go. <laughs> but you see, it was by the law that I had the knowledge of sin. God has his commandments. And uh, so many times we're just driving along thinking we're doing quite all right. But you see, God gives us the holy law so that we can see that we are sinners in the sight of a righteous and a holy God. After all, what is sin? There are many definitions of sin. Let me give you one of the best in the Bible. 1 John 3, verse 4, whosoever... Uh, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. Sin is just breaking God's law. Now, why did Jesus give this young man an illustration? Why did Jesus talk to this young man 
about keeping the commandments. I'll tell you why. God's mercy, God's grace will mean nothing to a man until, first of all, he sees himself a sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God, and God gives the law so that we might see that we are sinners. Remember this, by, uh, by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3, verse 20. Now, and by the way, those of you who have little boys and girls who want to come forward and be baptized, you say, Pastor Rogers, when is my child ready to be saved? When is my child ready to give his or her heart to Jesus Christ? When they see that they are sinners in the sight of a righteous and a holy God. You know, sometimes parents will make a big mistake. They'll, they'll get a little child and they'll say, do you believe in Jesus? Uh, do you love Jesus? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, are you willing to trust Jesus as your personal Savior? Yes. To believe he died for your sins on the cross? Yes, I do. Well, pastor, my child is ready. Not necessarily. You can get a child to give assent to all those propositions without ever seeing that he or she is a sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God. You ask a little child if they love Jesus, they'll say yes. You ask them if they love Bambi, they'll say yes. No, no. When a child sees that he or she is a sinner, not just naughty, not just simply as disobeyed dad or mom, but a sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God, that there's none good but one and that is God, then that little child's heart will cry out for a Savior. They don't have to have a Ph.D. in sin or theology in order to be saved, but they have to see themselves as a sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God, and so must you. And so the law is given that we might see in the sight of God that we are sinners. Because nobody is saved until they see this. Jesus said in Luke chapter 5 and verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The law doesn't save us, but friend, we know one thing, that the law gets us ready to be saved. So many don't have any concept of salvation because number one, they've never seen the absolute holiness of God. There's none good but one, that is God. And they have never seen themselves, therefore, as a sinner in the sight of a righteous and a holy God. And when a man has been wounded by God's law, then he's ready for the healing balm of salvation. Now, this young man had a superficial knowledge of the law. And Jesus said, you know the commandments? He said, well, I've kept them from my youth up. But let me give you a verse that's interesting. Romans chapter 7, verse 14, the Bible says the law is spiritual. That is, everything that you do... Uh, in the material or the outward way uh, may look all right, but the law is spiritual. It deals with the heart. For example, Jesus said, the law says don't commit adultery. But I say that when you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Now, there's some people say, well, I've never committed adultery, but God may have written down adultery in his records in heaven. The law says thou shalt not kill. But Jesus said if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty of breaking that commandment. See, the law is spiritual. Now, this young man had not seen that. So he said, yep, <laughs> I, I, I've kept them all. I've had no other gods before me. I have I not had any idols. I've not made any graven images. I have remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I've not taken God's name in vain. I've honored my father and my mother. I've not killed. I've not committed adultery. da, 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 da. Now, Jesus, like a skilled surgeon, watch this. He's about to take a scalpel and lance a putrefying boil. Jesus says, okay. <laughs> All right, young man. <laughs> Here's one other thing. This is one thing. Sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. You'll have great riches. One of the commandments says what? Thou shalt not covet. And this man was covetous. This man had an idol in his life. His God was gold. His creed was greed. Actually, you see, he said he kept the whole law. He had broken the whole law. On an occasion, a lawyer came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what is the, the, the first and great commandment? And Jesus said, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. 
And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And what Jesus did in that sentence, he just summed up the whole Ten Commandments. Love God and love your neighbor. That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. And now when Jesus said to this rich young ruler, okay, you are a law keeper, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come and follow me. He wasn't willing to do that. Number one, he loved his money more than he loved God. And number two, he loved his money more than he loved his neighbor. Do you see it? I mean, in, in, in reality, the spirit of this young man had broken all ten commandments by failing to do this one thing. Now, what Jesus is teaching here is that he's not teaching that you can go to heaven. You can buy your way into heaven by selling everything you have and giving it to the poor. What Jesus is doing is giving this man a revelation of his heart. Jesus is showing this man that he's guilty of the sin of covetousness and really whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. What Jesus is showing this man is the, the futility, the futility of trying to behave himself into heaven. All he had was a superficial knowledge of his own goodness. And so Jesus is revealing that this man, that to this man, that no one is kept or saved by commandment keeping. He's not teaching salvation by keeping the commandments. He's teaching the impossibility of salvation by keeping the commandments. Now, here's the third thing. Here's the third thing. Jesus is teaching this young man that no man can serve two masters, but he must serve one. No man can serve two masters, but he must serve one. Look in verses 21 and 22. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said, unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now watch this. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, why did Jesus make this request to this young man? Why did Jesus say to him, he, didn't, he hadn't said to me, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Most likely he's not said that to you. Why did he say that to this young man? This young man had an idol in his heart, an idol, I-D-O-L, a false god. You say, well, Adrian, how do you know that he had an idol in his heart? I'm going to show you in a moment. And what was this idol? This idol was his wealth, uh, his gold. You say, how do you know that? Well, look, if you will, in verses 23 and 24. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly, how difficultly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Now, he's not saying that a rich man can't be saved because he says later on that he can be saved. With God, all things are possible. But notice in verse 24, And, and the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Now watch this very carefully. Slow down with me. Children, how hard it is for them, now underscore these next four words, that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. That trust in riches. Whatever a man trusts is his God. Say amen. Whatever a man trusts is his God. Anything you love more, serve more, trust more, fear more than Almighty God is an idol. Do you see that? This man had an idol. This man had a false god. No man can serve two masters, but he must serve one. And what this man needed to do in order to have eternal life was to repent. Repent of what? Idolatry. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 speaks of how ye turn to God from idols to serve the true and the living God. Now this turning to God from idols, whatever the idol is in your heart and in your life, and it may not be money, but I'm telling you, one God is enough for everybody. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. That's what Jesus said. But friend, he must serve one. Now, if you have some other God in your life in order to be a Christian, in order to go to heaven, you cannot go to heaven by keeping the commandments and you cannot go to heaven by having an idol in your life. You must turn from that idol to God. Now, this turning is called repentance. And here's where many people miss salvation. They hear a preacher preach and they want to go to heaven. So they just think that they can hold on to their gods and just add Jesus in as one more God. But you must repent. Now, I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures that deal with repentance. 
I've copied them down because we don't have time to turn to them this morning, but you may want to list the references. Listen to them. Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus came saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Mark 6, verse 12, And they went out and preached that men should repent. Acts 2, verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted. Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, He saith unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name. Acts 17, verse 30, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 20, verse 21, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith, toward our Lord Jesus Christ. What is repentance? Repentance just simply means a change of mind. It comes from two Greek words, metanoia. It means a change of mind. I'm going this way. I'm serving this God. I have this idol in my life. I repent. I forsake that idol. I turn from my God of gold and I come and I follow Jesus Christ. Now here I want to ask you a question. Have you repented? Have you repented? I'm not asking, are you a member of Bellevue Baptist Church? I'm asking, have you turned from those idols in your life and made Jesus Christ Lord? On the authority of none less than Jesus Christ himself, I want to say to you, Luke 13, 3, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. No repentance, no redemption. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life. Now, I'm not teaching salvation by commandment keeping, but I am teaching that no man can serve two masters. You cannot hold your God of greed with one hand and your God of grace with the other hand. You have to turn from idols to serve the living God. And the problem in so many churches that people have joined churches and they have never really repented of their sin. And I dare say many people in this building today have never really repented of your sin. There has never been a change of mind. You have wanted to acquire eternal life just like this rich young ruler did. And some preacher said, well, if you just some accept Jesus as your Savior, uh, you'll be saved. The Bible never says accept Jesus as your Savior. Never. The Bible says receive Christ as your Lord. As your Lord. And he is your Savior. But he must be your Lord. No man can serve two masters. And Jesus said, how hard it is for those that trust in riches. Whatever you trust, if you're not trusting Jesus, you're not going to make it to heaven. Now, this, this rich young ruler would have been happy to accept the message that's preached in the average church today, the feel-good religion, and give him a little religiosity, and baptize him, take him into the church. Now, Jesus is not teaching works righteousness, but he is teaching that no man can serve two masters, but he must serve one. Jesus is saying, you come and follow me. Now, here's the fourth and the final thing I want you to see today. Whatever master a man chooses will master that man. Whatever master a man chooses will master that man. Again, look, if you will, in verses 21 and 22. Uh, Jesus says here, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, that is, forsake your old master. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, we talked about repentance in the last point. Now we're talking about faith. Because you see, repentance and faith are Siamese twins. When you turn from sin, you turn to Jesus. This man's sin was greed. He had to turn from it, and he turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. This man needed a new master. Jesus says, come and follow me. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Answer that question. Now, don't answer it the way that you're supposed to answer it. Answer it the way, I mean, you're supposed to answer it to be, to look good, because this is in your own heart. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
Faith is not merely nodding ahead to a series of theological facts about Jesus. It is enthroning Jesus. Now, folks, your eternal destiny depends upon this. Don't fight with me now mentally. Ask yourself, have I seen what Jesus tells this young man? There is none good but one, that is God. You cannot have a false idol in your life. Repent of your sin. Come and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Look, if you will, in verse 22, it's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Jesus is giving this man a choice. And Jesus now had struck a vital nerve. I see this young man. Watch him. <sighs> he begins to breathe hard. I see him as he bites his lip. He thinks about all that he has and all that he's been trusting in for so long. He sees Jesus Christ over here and he sees eternal life. And there's a choice. And the demons of hell begin to whisper in his ear, Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Don't give up all of this. The Holy Spirit says, give your heart to Christ. You can't be saved by keeping the commandments, and you can't keep your wealth either. Jesus is not talking about losing everything. He's talking about finding everything. He's talking about having treasure in heaven. Give your heart to Christ. The perspiration breaks out on his brow. Shall I go this way? Finally, he says to Jesus, no, no, no. And he turns back to his God, his idol. Demons shout with glee. Angels weep. Who knows what this young man might have been? He might have been another Timothy. He may have been another Apostle Paul. He might have been in God's who's who, but now he's in who's not, and he's in hell, and he doesn't have his treasure. He has his false God that will torment him for all eternity. And Jesus let him go. And he'll let you go also. Whatever master a man chooses will master that man. You give your heart to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ will master you. You come and follow him. And there's the decision before you. Pastor, why would you call the sermon three strikes and you're out? I'll tell you why. Every man has three opportunities to go to heaven. Number one, he or she can die before the age of accountability. And if you die before the age of accountability as a little baby, you go straight to heaven. Did you know that? Heaven has a lot of little babies in heaven. I've got a little baby boy in heaven. He didn't know how to talk before he stepped over into heaven. But I've got a little baby named Philip. I'm going to meet him there. Uh, because he never came to the age of accountability. Can you understand what I am saying right now? Can you? All right, then that's strike one for you. You are at the age of accountability. All right, you are. So, so you missed that opportunity to go to heaven. Now, here's another way to go to heaven. Are you ready? Keep the commandments absolutely perfectly, never sin, anytime, anywhere, in thought or deed. Keep all the commandments. Now, that's only theoretical because nobody's ever done that and nobody ever will. That's why Jesus is teaching this man. Theoretically, if you kept the commandments, you could go to heaven. Theoretically, you could, but actually nobody ever has. Is there anybody here who would dare stand up and say, I've never sinned one time in thought, word, or deed? Anybody? Nobody. Strike two. Strike two. There's one more opportunity. 
for you to go to heaven. And that is to come and follow Jesus Christ who died upon that cross for you. And if you fail to do that, folks, I want to tell you, strike three and you're out. You're out. This young man struck out. He was accountable. He could not keep the commandments. And he failed to give his heart to Jesus Christ. If I could sit in that seat this morning for you, get up out of that seat and walk down this aisle and give my heart to Jesus Christ on your behalf, I would, but I cannot. I preached as best I know how. And I am telling you, friend, that if you will receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He will save you, and bless God, He will keep you saved just like He's kept me saved. The Bible says, Sweetly, plainly, simply, sublimely, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt. B. What's that next word? Save. Father God, I pray that many today will come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Friend, one more time, I want to remind you that our Lord says, cast all your burden upon me, for I care for you. One of the burdens that we share is the burden of sin, unforgiven. Do you have that burden? I led a man to Christ one time, and after he prayed, he said, Mr., it seems to me that I've been carrying around a load of rocks and I just set them down. Would you like to set down that load of rocks and let the Lord Jesus Christ lift that burden? Would you pray this way? Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm lost. I need to be saved. Thank you for loving me in spite of my sin. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to pay my sin debt with his shed blood. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sin, Cleanse me, take control of my life, and begin now to make me the person you want me to be. If you pray that prayer, trust the Lord to do what you ask Him to do, and then write to us so we can rejoice with you, and we'll send you some literature to help you to get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you as we've studied God's Word together. For more resources from Adrian Rogers, including copies or downloads of this message, as well as Pastor Rogers' outline, notes, or a complete transcript of this message, please visit our website, lwf.org. You can also sign up to receive our daily Heartbeat emails. Each Heartbeat contains a daily scripture and devotional thought from Adrian Rogers, an inspirational 90-second treasure from the Word, as well as a link to our daily radio program delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each morning. Or, if you're looking for some inspiration and encouragement to get you through the week, check us out on social media at LWF Ministries. Thanks for joining us for today's program. We'll see you next time. Find victory in the struggles you face every day through profound practical insights from the Word of God. As a thank you for your gift this month, we'd love to send you our Struggles booklet collection from Love Worth Finding. This booklet set features five powerful and practical messages from Adrian Rogers, turning problems into possibilities, dealing with depression, getting on top of your finances, the battle of the bottle, and the freedom of forgiveness. Request the Struggles booklet collection when you call to give at 1-800-647-9400 or give online at lwf.org. Find hope and direction in your stressful circumstances. Call or go online today. Hi, I'm Kerry Vaughn with Love Worth Finding. This year, God has blessed us with unprecedented opportunities to share the gospel through the trusted voice of Adrian Rogers. In these difficult times, people are actively seeking the love of Jesus. Your partnership in this ministry has helped people come to Christ and grow in their faith. We are now at the end of our current fiscal year. Help us finish strong. Your gift by June 30th will point even more people to the greatest love worth finding, Jesus Christ.